I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine a prisoner. He's, he's in a cell. There are no windows. It's in the center of the building. And he's been there for years in the darkness. And one day, a jailer comes and unchains the chains that are around his hands and his feet. He unlocks them. He opens the cell door and says, you're free to go. He steps out into the sunlight, feels the warmth. All he's ever felt for the longest time has been cold and darkness, and dampness. And he walks out and he feels the sun beating on his face, sees the world in the colors, because all he's seen is these, this dark cell. See, that's what Jesus does to us spiritually. We're prisoners to sin. We're prisoners to death. And he sets us free. He unlocks the chains of, of sin and sets us free to live a new life in him. We must know the truth and speak the truth and think on things that are true. Good morning. Turn to your Bibles to the book of Philippians. You know, there was once a college student who needed to raise some money for his tuition. He was struggling and trouble, had trouble raising, getting the money he needed, so he decided that one day he would begin to sell Bibles door to door. Now, when he approached the home of the school president, thinking, obviously, I mean, it's the school president, I mean, you think they would buy a Bible. But the president's wife was the one who answered the door, and she politely declined to buy a Bible. Now, as the student began to walk away, he started walking down the steps, and, and he had a limp, kind of like I do this morning, but his was for other reasons. And she apologized to him. She says, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that you were disabled. And the student turned to her and responded, yes, it, it does color my life but I get to choose the color. You know, we, we don't walk through life and all of a sudden stumble without even knowing it into the muck and mire of this world. We, we don't go through life and, and accidentally begin to sin. We, it begins in our minds. Our, our, our minds are a powerful thing. Our minds determine how we react to things. We can choose the color of our lives. And even in the midst of our circumstances, we can do that today. And the Apostle Paul is going to give us today in our verses, he's going to give us some guidance on how to color our lives, how to cultivate a mindset that honors God, brings us peace in our lives today. He instructs the church at Philippi to color their life with thoughts and things that are of God. So Philippians 4, beginning verse 8, he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Father, we praise you. Help us, Lord, to think on these things and not on the things that the evil one wants us to think on. We pray this by your grace. Amen. The first thing that Paul tells us that we are to be thinking on are things that are true. Now, in our world today, the truth is getting harder and harder to determine. 
I was going to show you some videos, I, I decided not to do it, of what are called deep fakes. It looks like that person, but it really isn't that person. With computers today, they're able to take your voice and, and they can modulate a computer program to sound exactly like you. You may have gotten a phone call, sounds like somebody calling you, but the reality, chances are it's a computer. And your response will trigger that computer to respond in a certain way. Now, right now, you can kind of tell. Uh, there's a the guy I watch, his name's Rick Beato. He's a, he's a music producer, or was a music producer. Now he just teaches online. He was walking around listening to a song, and the song was completely created by a computer. The rhythm, the music, the voices, all by a computer. And his kids could tell, because they have a tendency, they can hear it in the voice. But there's going to come a day where you will not be able to hear it at all. You will not be able to tell the difference. It's going to be harder and harder to tell what is real and what is not real. What is the truth and what is a lie. Not to mention the fact that our world is full of misinformation and deceit. You cannot believe what you see online, what you see in the media, which makes focusing on the truth and thinking on things that are true even more important. I want you to think about this politically. We're in, we just saw the debate. If you might have watched the debate, I didn't watch it. I watched stuff afterwards. I don't think I could have sat through the whole thing. Who's telling the truth? If you lean to the right, well, it's the Republicans. If you lean to the, lean to the left, well, it's the Democrats. But you know, if we were honest with ourselves, both parties are lying to us. In order for us to take Paul's advice, to think about what is true, we have to know what is the truth. Now when Pilate, asked, Pilate was asking Jesus, Jesus is standing before him, and, he, and, and Pilate says, what is truth? The amazing thing about that statement was the fact that truth was standing right there in front of him. And he couldn't see it. And you and I have the same problem in this world. We have, we have to have some basis, some foundation of what truth is. In John 14, 6, Jesus told us what truth is. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, I am truth. You want to know what the truth is? Look to Jesus. Knowing Jesus is essential to understanding and living the truth. Because truth is rooted in the very character of God. Isaiah 65, 16 tells us that it describes God as the God of truth. God's words and actions are always reliable, always trustworthy, according to Numbers 23, 19 and Psalm 33, 4. The truthfulness of God is at the very core of his nature, so much so that God cannot lie. And Paul tells us this in Titus 1, 2. God can't lie. The Bible must be our ultimate source of truth. In our small group, we're studying, right now we're studying doctrine, we're studying the five, the five um, solos, which were the five basic doctrines of the Reformation. And one of them is sola scriptura, scripture alone. Scripture is our foundation of the truth. There are a lot of things going on in our churches today. There are a lot of churches that have said that this is okay and that's not okay. And I always say, you know what? I don't care how you feel. I don't care what works. I want to know what the Bible says. What does God say about this? You may believe that it's okay for women to be pastors, or you may not believe that it's okay for women to be pastors. But I can tell you what. Tell me what the Bible says. I'm not going to get into that today. Maybe I'll do a sermon on that sometime. Some of you believe it's fine. I'll have to edit this out of YouTube because they will not allow me to say that online. Some people say sin. What does the Bible say? Some people think that we shouldn't love those people who are in sin. What does the Bible tell us? We need to love everybody. Not condone what they do. Not allow them to continue in their sin. Bring it to their attention and pray for them. We're not to treat them any differently. We're not to treat them unless, in fact, Scripture tells us 
<laughs> you know, that when you have a brother who doesn't, who sins and doesn't repent, then you shun them. It never tells us to shun non-believers, but it tells us to, sh to shun believers who sin and refuse to repent. That's what the Bible tells us. That's what I want to know. It has to be the source of our truth. Psalm 119, 160, the psalmist wrote, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. See, the thing about truth in Scripture, it's not just about the factual accuracy. We just want to say, it is, I, want, I want to know the facts. I want to know exactly what, it, what the facts are. It, it's, the truth in Scripture is not always about factual accuracy, but it's also about moral integrity. We're called to live in truth. This involves honesty, faithfulness, righteousness, we, we, we need to align our lives with God's standards and his commands. Now, the world will tell you, people will say, well, you Christians, you live under all those rules. Man, that must be stifling. The reality is, it's extremely liberating. Jesus told us in John 8, he says, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, what does it set us free from? It, it, it's got multiple dimensions here. It, it, it frees us, obviously frees us from sin. The truth will free us from sin. The truth that Jesus came, he's the son of God. He died on the cross for us. He, he rose again on the third day and he's coming back again. That we, we cannot, we do not live a life apart from him, that nothing we do can save us. We are not good enough. We need him. In a few minutes, I'll be talking about the imputed righteousness of Christ that's put on us. It's not our, no matter how good I am, it's not my righteousness. I'm not living in the truth if I'm just being a good person, which there are no good people. I was loving when people say, well, they're a good person. No, they're not. There's no one who's good except for God. Again, another truth of Scripture. We are called to live in truth, being honest, faithful, righteous. We have to align our lives. It's liberating. We get, truth, we get freedom from sin, freedom from deception. If we know the truth, then we can tell what is a lie. Somebody comes up to you and says something's in the Bible. What do you do? You believe them or do you go to the Bible? You go to the Bible. Well, tell me where it says that. Well, it's somewhere in there. No, no, no. I want to see it. Show me. We get freedom from fear. I have no fear anymore. Now, I'll be honest with you. I have fear of snakes. <laughs> I don't, I'm not fearful of them. I just don't like them. I'm not afraid of spiders. But I'm afraid of heights. So does that mean that I'm not living in truth? Well, no. The, the fear that we're not that they're not to be afraid of anymore. We don't need to be afraid of the world. We don't need to be afraid of the evil that's in this world. We don't need to be afraid of death. We don't need to be afraid of hell. We don't need to be afraid of any of those things that could bring us fear. And we have the freedom to live righteously. And how do we get this? How do we get this freedom? We get this freedom by knowing and living in Christ. Abiding in his word, meaning going to the truth and living it, reading it, knowing it. I, I challenge anybody. I always just, I challenge someone who says they don't believe in God. I said, have you read the Bible? Well, no. Then how do you know? Read the word. Read the gospels. Start out with John. Read it. And after you read all four gospels, come back and tell me that, you're, that you don't believe in God anymore at all. And then I'll, let you, I'll, I'll accept it. Other than that, until you have looked into it, you can't tell me you don't believe it. Because see, as we embrace the truth, we're going to experience this true liberation that only Christ can provide us. And if we understand that we need to live out these truths, we get to experience the fullness of the freedom that we have in Christ. See, we, we can't just know these things. We have to live them out.
That's the danger today, I think, in our world and in many churches. They know the truth, they just don't live it. We have to live it also, or we will not experience the truth.